We are honored to have with us Tim Piggott Smith, who is performing in uh, King Charles III over at the Music Box Theater. And uh, Georgette Timoney, our great producer, tells me it's one of the best plays she's seen in years because? It's a fantastic play. It's about the royal family, obviously. You guys, for some reason, are obsessed with the royal family. It's about Here a moment in time when Charles might take over the throne, which, of course, the Queen being the longest serving monarch ever, mm. Charles is the longest serving heir apparent ever. And you play? He's, I'm King playing Charles. Charles. Yeah. yeah. It's just a fantastic play about what, what might happen. It, it turns into a, a, a tragedy, but it's a hugely entertaining play. The thing that surprised us when we first stood it up in front of an audience was how funny it is. How funny yeah, it is? It's really funny. I don't ask me why. Oh, wait, Georgia said she cried. <laughs> yeah, well, you do cry. Okay, okay, I'm not going to say fun. anything. I'm not saying anything. I'm not gonna, but, okay. I mean, for example, when Harry comes on at the beginning, the lady playing Camilla, Margot Lester, is brilliant. Just don't say, oh, Harry, here. And the audience laugh. Don't, don't even ask me why. They I enjoy won't. it. It's huge fun. How'd they get you? Hmm? How'd they get you to do this? Because last time you performed on Broadway is 1999 yeah. in? I did The Iceman Cometh with Kevin Spacey. Oh, that guy. That guy, yeah, yeah. He's pretty good. Yeah, he should be an actor. He should think about it. <laughs> what an underachiever he no, is. Oh, you're kidding. Well, of course, we, he's just run the, one of our major theatres in England for the last 11 years, right. the old right. Vic. You know, we owe him a lot, because the theatre was about to go to the wall, and, he's, and he gave 11 years of his life to it. Yeah. So it um, one of the major themes in this play is freedom of the press. Yes. Talk about that. Well... What's interesting about the play, when they sent it to me, um, I'd worked with Rupert Gould, the director, before. I did Enron with him, which didn't work here, but in England it was a massive hit. And I'd known Rupert a long time, and he just brought me this play and said, I think, this is, I think you might like this. And I thought, well, a play about the modern royal family, that's not very interesting. About ten minutes in, there comes a scene where Charles talks to the Prime Minister and they have a battle, and Charles defends the freedom of... The, of speech. Charles does. Charles does, which is very surprising because one might feel that as a man who'd to an extent been victimized by the press or certainly hounded by the press, he would want to curtail them. And um, he doesn't. So the audience come on side with him immediately and go, well, he's a man of principle. And that's really what the story is. It's a story of what happens when somebody of huge principle just digs his feet in and then the dominoes start to fall. In terms of um, the obsession with the royal family, mm. what do you think it's based on? Well, I mean, I, I say in the play at one point, it's only in the last 500 years that politicians <laughs> and democracy have led the way in policy, and I can say that without any irony, because the Parliament arrived in, in, in England, you Is know... That you? That's me. That's, <laughs> that's me just, with Camilla. Just checking. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Keep talking, you 500 know, pa years. Parliament arrived in, in, uh, in England in the, in the 16th century. So um, we'd had a monarchy long before that, and I can say that without any irony. And I think it's to do with the longevity, you know, that it's been there. It's a staggering institution. And the other thing is, as people will know if they've come to London, we do theatre pretty well. We mm. do royal theatre like nothing on earth. If you're in the Mall and you happen to see the horse guards going down the Mall to the palace, boy, it's exciting. I mean, they look magnificent. The horses are fantastic. The sun's gleaming. The costumes are amazing. We do that really well. You know, what? coronations, funerals, amazing events. What is it with England and the theatre that we don't understand? I think by some quirk of character, we're not openly emotional. And fundamentally, it's more interesting to watch somebody fighting their emotions than expressing them. I'm sorry, I'm Italian, I don't understand. <laughs> hey. I'm sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> Excellent. Fighting one's yeah, emotions. I think it's more interesting to see somebody trying not to cry, basically, than seeing somebody cry. It's more... Internalising? It's, it's, just, it's just more interesting to watch. I don't know. And I think that, you know, and of course we have a linguistic tradition that goes back, you know, a good play is well written. Our play is phenomenally written. It's just a brilliant piece it's of writing. It's done in verse. It's written in blank verse, in, Sha in Shakespearean blank verse. But, but that makes it sound as though it's sort of po-faced. I was talking to somebody downstairs, the, uh, Alex, who's in School of Rock, and he said, he, about 15 minutes in, he suddenly thought, 
this is in blank verse, this is iambic pentameters. And he nudged his wife, it doesn't matter if you don't know what an iambic pentameter or black verse is, you can have a really good time listening. If you do know about that, then you get an added level of enjoyment from the play. And there are Shakespearean mm. references, you know, within the play. I abdicate at the end of the play. That is a, a quote from Shakespeare's Richard II. It's like that, you know. You know, it's so interesting. You just mentioned <clears throat> Alex. Uh, Alex is joining us. He's in School of Rock, yeah. another great... Uh, Alex Brightman, right? Alex Brightman, who is uh, performing in School of Rock, who plays uh, the Jack Black character. Mm. Um, Dewey Finn, right? So what I'm fascinated by is you see him downstairs in our great studio mm -hmm. here, the Tisch WNET operation here in the heart of Lincoln Center. Do actors here in New York, in the Broadway community, know each other, or do they just run into each other and say, hey, I saw your play? I'm curious about that, just because you mentioned that. Well, I mean, I just met him downstairs, and that's, that's what happened to me. Normally, I would go to the theater on my days off. This part is you so... Would? You yeah. would go see somebody else's work? I mean, if I was free to go and see James L. Jones, who's in a theater opposite me, I would be there, because I worship him. You know, I first saw him in 1968 playing the Emperor Jones in Edinburgh. And I mean, it's just one of the greatest performances I've ever seen. I'd be there, but this part is so demanding and I'm no spring chicken. So I tend to go from the, the theatre back to my apartment and I don't do really very much else. It's, I'm, I'm rather annoyed because I like being in New York and I'm not really being able to enjoy being here very much. You made a reference to spring chicken. Um, I don't buy it, but here's my question. When, and I ask actors this question a lot, um, but I'm fascinated by it, I hope our audience is as well. When did you know you wanted to be an actor? I never made an active decision. Um, we, my mother, I think, would have been an actress had she been born at a different time and into a different class. She came from the lower middle class. Her father had a little grocery shop. And I think people at that time, there wasn't a huge distinction between being an actress and being a lady of the street. So they wow. were nervous. They were very nervous. But then I think actually I started fulfilling my mother's ambitions. And um, my parents wanted me to go to university. I went to Bristol University where I studied drama. And then I went to a drama school and it, nothing stopped me. I just sort of drifted towards it. Drifted? And, yeah. Not an obsession? Well, Not well, an obsession I, I, of yours? I suppose it was, but I, ne <clears throat> I, I, I never had to make a choice. That's my point, Steve, you know. And I think mm. that's when you really know what you want to do. Hang, hang on, I, I'm being denied this. I'm going to go for it. I never had to do that. I just sort of walked into it. I think it was easier then than it is for young people now. Well, however it happened, uh, over at the Music Box Theatre, King Charles III, it's a terrific play. People should go out and see it. And by the way, do not wait 16 or so years before you come back, okay? Please. Please don't do Pass that. Pass me back. We will, we, I, you know everybody wants you back. I may not back. be able to wait 16 <laughs> or so more years, Steve. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks Wish you nothing but the, the best. Thank you. It was great. Bless you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Englewood Hospital and Medical Center, Wells Fargo, Delta Dental of New Jersey, New Jersey Council of County Colleges, PSE&G, the Mental Health Association in New Jersey, and by Cohn Resnick. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.